lecture. We're always pleased on these occasions to recognize the two people who have made this lecture possible. And I hope you will join in saluting Joe and Betty Henderson, who are here with us tonight. Joe, as all of you will remember, and those of you who don't, I'm going to tell you, spent some marvelous years on this campus in our Department of Education, 31 to be exact. Joe and Betty are here. Betty also spent many, spent many of her years in education, and what a wonderful tribute it is to have them here. Joe and Betty, would you stand so you can receive a Westminster Award? I want to 
give it a try. Well, Betty took ceramics like a duck to water, and she became the personification of this poem by Octavio Paz. Among clay petals is born smiling the human flower. The various poems and quotes that I will be using tonight will be available to you after the lecture. I call these my spiritual readings because they add a special richness to my life. My topic is the evolution of visual forms, a personal search. This lecture represents the 25 years that I have been involved in the ceramic arts. During all this time, I have been experimenting with three-dimensional forms. The persistent goal and challenge is the creation of the perfect object. But how does one do that? Where do you begin? How do you proceed? The studio situation is a very solitary and private experience. We usually hide or destroy our failures. But of course, they are our best teachers. But the ugly ducklings can only turn into the swans through growth and transformation. As a result of so many years of intensive work, I came to realize that exhibitions reveal only the answers, all of the important questions, the stepping stones of the creative process were safely hidden away in the recesses of my studio. The development of meaningful and substantive approaches to problem solving are not being publicly addressed. How to make aesthetic decisions is the most difficult concept to define. At the bottom line, you must be your harshest critic. I hope to give you some insights regarding the evolution of my work. I have decided to focus on two major directions that have been long-term themes in my ceramic life, the teapot and my cactus motif. Both of these subjects have gone through many stages of development, always evolving and changing, persistently challenging me to discover new solutions to visual problems. A wonderful aspect about teaching is that our students never cease to surprise us. The slide on the right was a gift to me from Myra Davis, a current junior at Westminster. When the announcement of this lecture appeared in the Westminster Weekly last spring, Myra collected many copies of the paper and created this Warholian work. <laughs> Little did she know how applicable it would be for my introduction this evening. So I will now begin the slides with a poem by Muriel Rukeyser. It is called Islands. They look at each other across the glittering sea. Some keep a low profile. Some are cliffs. The bathers think islands are separate like them. But oh, for God's sake, they are connected underneath. Like that poem and these two slides before you, all of my work is connected underneath. And it's those connections I will be discussing. After briefly exploring other avenues of expression, like a piano duet with my sister Patty, <laughs> I produced my very first ceramic object in the second or third grade. Now I ask you, who would ever have guessed that the direction of my life would be rooted in this innocent little sculpture? Ah, but mothers, what wise people they turn out to be. They salvage from our oblivion our own history. <laughs> Picasso stated that every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist when one grows up. My father's passion in life was fishing. Consequently, all of our vacations were spent trying to catch those big ones. If you've ever been involved with this sport, then you know what a keeper is. It's the ones you don't throw away. In the creative world, we share the same goal. We are always after those keepers. Then there are the days when you might have gotten lots of bites. You really tried your best, but they all got away. 
They were the losers. <laughs> and anyone who has been in ceramics longer than we well knows about those loser days. <laughs> High school graduation. <laughs> a milestone that you can all relate to. If you have the nerve to show such a slide. <laughs> I'm going off to college now to be an art major. That much I knew. But I had absolutely no idea that ceramics was a subject, much less a career option. Bernard Leach the famous English potter, recalled this episode in his book, The Potter's Challenge, and I quote, Two girls once came to visit me in St. Ives. They were interested in pottery, but they didn't know very much about it. And I decided that I would talk to them very straight. You are interested in pottery. Do you know what that means? Do you know that to have the whole world's pottery to look at? is like having the whole world's food to eat. Can you digest it? Can you find a way of judging what is a good pot? Whether it is made in 12th century China, in Persia or Greece, in Europe or by American Indians? How can you come to say with conviction to other people and to yourself, that is a good <coughs> pot? Are you prepared for that? It means a whole life's work and it means that you must care about it tremendously. The girls went away, rather thoughtful. As a sophomore, I enrolled in my first ceramics class. It was a requirement for our education. These pictures on the right should offer some encouragement to all of my students, for you see, we all begin at the same place. These beginning pieces were treasures to me when I first made them. My mother saved these from oblivion also. And now, 25 years later, they are treasures to me again, as they represent the first stages in my potter's challenge. Mm. My very first teapot and my last teapot to date. A span of 25 years separates them. Although they may look very different, in fact, they share a lot of common ground. First of all, neither one of them can pour tea. <laughs> one of them is supposed to, but it doesn't work very well. <laughs> Secondly, both represent the beginnings of new directions. And thirdly, both deal with the complexity of their components, a foot, a body, a spout, a lid, and a handle. The teapot has kept my interest over the years because it is the most complicated of the ceramic standard forms. It offers the fullest opportunity to develop relationships between its distinct parts, and it can accommodate a huge range of distortions without losing its identity. And it offers a sense of discipline. For me, the essence of this slide comparison is beautifully stated in the following poem by Alan Watts. The morning glory, which blooms for an hour, differs not at heart from the giant pine, which lives for a thousand years. Both of these early pots have awkward proportions. The commercial handles look out of place, being too puny for the size of the pot. After the bamboo handles, I went through a series of leather macrame handles in an attempt to give more substance to that handle form. After se several years separate these pieces, I've elongated the spout for better pouring and changed from a raised dome lid to a recessed lid for a firmer lid seat for pouring. For me, the clay handles became a more satisfactory handle solution. Being physically wedded to the teapot provided a firmer feel in the hand, and I could judge the portions of all of its components in a better way. 
These were also my bread and butter pieces. They were functional and saleable. And at the time, I was only um, part-time here. <laughs> I needed that bread and butter. <laughs> After several years of producing the, quote, straight-handled teapots, which you just looked at, I got bored with that and began noodling up the handles. These beginnings were rather timid as I played and searched for solutions. These followed very closely into the preceding pots. They represent the midway point in this particular series. I was having fun playing with the handles, but they had a weak relationship with the body of the pot. One doesn't realize all this when you're making them. You only realize it when you're going to give a lecture like this. <laughs> and start to study it. <laughs> this, this, this pot represents where I was heading. I wanted the design of the handle to be integrated with the body of the pot. I wanted them to be functional, as I was still part-time here then. <laughs> and I also wanted them to be interesting and aesthetic. During this series, I was also making matching cups for the various sets. Again, the handles wrap around the form to create a uniform wholeness. These represent the completion of that series. About four years separate the first decorative handle designs from these last ones. The goal, however, being the same at that time. A big change has now taken place. I have switched from stoneware clay body to porcelain. This opened up new avenues to explore due to the whiteness of the clay and its smooth texture. These represent the early stages of my log involvement of applying colored slips to the leather hard surface, then carving through the color, working back to the white of the clay. I spent many years exploring this technique. And these are the beginning pieces. These are continued examples of the slip decorating technique. Seven years actually separate these two. The iris jar is a different theme, but the same technical direction. And one thing always leads to another. The slide on the left is a precursor to a long series. The grooves on the shoulder and lid of the left slide were the first stages of drawing or incising on the form, which eventually led to the trace series, an example on the right, and to the feather series. Basically, a celadon glaze will pool in the incised lines and create a value change which makes the lines visible. A sewing tracing wheel was used here with a period at the end of each line for the slide on the right. The swirl design also relates to my earlier interest in handles that wrap around the forms. These feather designs held my attention for many years. I was interested in the movement around the form that the lines created. It takes much patience to produce this kind of work. Four to eight hours of drawing and two to four hours of sanding the lines with stiff oil painting brushes. Because, finally, I had achieved my goals with the feather pieces, there ceased to be a challenge there. Therefore, I also lost the patience required to produce them. Consequently, I needed to move on to something quite different. These two pieces represent the beginning and the end of the following series. The early ones, the example on the left, represented um, on the left had spouts that were quite humorous in their awkward proportions. I made dozens of these things, not realizing until I went to photograph them how silly they looked. <laughs> Such surprises occur like this. After having a good laugh with myself when I went to photograph them, I altered the spouts and added a handle to the lid to assist the overall design. 
Now, six years will pass before returning to the teapot form, which happened to be last summer and fall of 1990. We will view them at a later, later on in the lecture. A slideshow without my studio assistant of 18 and a half years would be incomplete. He passed away last summer, but his presence remains in my studio. He was a little lover, too. Many interests feed my work, which brings to mind a statement made by Beatrice Wood, a 98-year-old potter who still works in her studio every day. And I quote, Nothing that happens to a person from the outside is of importance. All that matters is the courage with which one goes through life. I raise cactus and I visit them in the deserts. I have sustained a long-term interest in this subject matter because it provides such a wealthy source of information through the endless variation of shape, volume, scale, color, texture, and pattern. I am intrigued by the tensions created between the fleshy plant body and its protective spines, the contrast of delicate blooms to massive stalks, as well as by the precarious balance achieved with these weighty forms. As I study these plants, I continue to discover sensitive relationships inherent within their complex components. They are also very functional at Christmas time. <laughs> and I invite all of you to come and visit my house up you know, north on the hill at Christmas time so you can see what they really look like decorated. <laughs> 1977 to 1990. My first cactus wall plate and my last cactus wall relief to date. They share the same theme, and they both hang on the wall. From Ovid's Metamorphosis, I quote, There is nothing constant in the universe, all ebb and flow. And every shape that's born bears in its womb the seeds of change. The process of drawing with underglazed pencils on bisque plates is how these were produced. Composing on a circular format was a constant challenge, presenting compositional problems. For the vertical series on the left, I used a light and dark banding on the rim to assist the problem. But I also discovered that selecting a circular plant helped solve it, <laughs> the compositional problems it is, a little easier. There is a four to five year separation between these two slides of details. I have changed media. The pencil couldn't provide a dark enough range of value to give the spatial depth I was seeking. Eventually, I changed to commercial underglazed colorants in order to achieve a broader range of value, which aided in the three dimensional um, effect. But learning how to control the media was an experimental process. Both of these examples are quite harsh in their contrast of light to dark. But I kept pushing toward my goal. Finally, the example on the right worked for me. I felt good about the value gradations and about the composition. This piece received an award at a national clay competition in California. Unfortunately, en route, it was broken by UPS. It is now glued together and hanging in my house to remind me of the frailties of the human condition and of ceramics. Always a good reminder. Keeps you human. You can see the difference in the modeling between these two slide details the right one being more successful.
There is a three-year separation between these two plates. Although they have the same subject matter, exactly the same plant, the technique changed. On the left slide, I was using an etching needle to carve through the underglaze colorants back to the white of the clay, a very, very slow process. Also very hard on your hands and your knuckles as it um, makes you get cramps in your hands. The one on the left, I'm using oil painting brushes, water, and a jeweler's hand drill in order to um, make the process a little bit easier. These are two detail slides of the previous plates, and they reveal the change in the process. The hand drill, which is used on the right to make the little white lines, also gave a livelier and more active line to the um, drawing. Each one of these plates still took a month to produce, a month of eight hours a day working on them. I was part-time, of course. <laughs> at that time. <laughs> because of the length of each one of these plates, a, a month for each drawing, I thought that I would try to speed up the process. See, the plate on the left is an example of this. A jeweler's hand drill is also called a Dremel tool, and it comes with very, very many different kinds of ends on it. And I bought them all and decided to experiment, thinking, ah, I got the idea done. If I could just make it go faster, I could make more of these things. However, the experiment to speed up the process didn't really work. Only the slow, laborious modeling of using the um, oil painting brushes and water gave me the desired 3D qualities that I was seeking at that time. A major interest for me in relation to these plates is beautifully stated by Gaston Bachelard in his book, The Poetics of Space, and I quote, Everything comes alive when contradictions are involved. The contradictions here being the fleshy plant body and the protective spines. I reached my goal here, but once again, the challenge was over. Therefore, the patience required to produce these plates totally dried up. And I didn't do another plate for three years. I returned again to the plates after a spring vacation camping trip to Big Bend National Park, where I saw cactus in bloom for the first time. This had a big effect on my work, giving me the information needed to work with more color. I loved this plate when I made it, and I still like it. But it now, once again, will be four more years before I return to these wall plates again. Now it's 1988, in the beginning of my sabbatical year. I hadn't had time to do these plates, because I was now department chair. <laughs> Eats up everything. So on the sabbatical, I thought, great, now I've got time to go back to these plates, with um, refreshed ideas and the time to do them. So I had changed my attitude about them. Consequently, I changed my process. I wanted to loosen up the throne forms, not have them be so regular. I wanted the whole process to go faster. And I wanted the drawings to be more spontaneous. Consequently, I totally changed how I was working on them. The previous plates, I was working on bisque plates already which were then white. Now I was working what is called wet on wet, using um, underglaze stains to do the drawings. But unfortunately, I couldn't really see what I was doing because the, plate, the clay body itself was gray until firing. I also ran into very many technical problems with cracking, and I lost 50% of the painted plates. In the previous batch of plates, I was also losing 50% of the thrown plates, but I wasn't drawing on them until after they had been bisque fired. So I wasn't putting the time in for the drawings until after they were already bisque fired and I wasn't losing them anymore. But losing 50% of the drawn ones became very discouraging. So of course I quit. <laughs> Too stupid. <laughs> Sometimes. I needed to change directions. 
these are the last um, wall plates of that particular phase. But like I said, the cracking was too um, immense. In fact, the plate on the right was cracked, and I glued it back together and it's hanging in the house. Um, but I did stop doing these plates at that time, and I haven't returned yet. But I'm not dead yet either. <laughs> However, I continued to work with the cactus motif, but now I was doing it on porcelain tall jars. The slide on the left is the first cactus jar that I did, and the one on the left is the last one. A major development occurred between these two, although only one year separates these two pieces. It, the changes have to do with the um, layered slips. On the right one, there's just a single layer of slip, and on the you know, the left one for you. On the right one, there are multiple layers of slips. Of course, all of it taking much more time and lengthening the process to produce one. There was also a major change in the concept of the lids, which I'll be discussing in uh, another slide in detail. These are two details of the jars. They give you, they expose the difference between a single layer of slip on the left and multiple layers of slip on the right, which gives it um, more depth and more richness. In the beginning of the series, the lids were not incorporated into the form of the pot, nor were they, were they incorporated into the drawing on the form. That changed as I developed um, my aesthetic about them and decided that the lid really needed to be more a part of the whole pot through the drawing. These are process pieces to give you an idea of what it's like to be building up these surfaces with multiple layers. I think you can tell which one's the earlier one. Hmm. The last component, the slide on the left, was always the spines because I was relying on the white porcelain clay body for that part of it. But what you put into the fire isn't always what you get out of the fire. The slide on the left is what I saw before I got it out. The slide on the right is what came out of the kiln. So the colors all changed and got a lot darker. This was something that you then learn from and deal with in your future um, pots. Again, the slide on the left is the first stage. It went through hundreds of stages. And the slide on the right is the finished piece. This one was purchased by the Westinghouse Corporation for the, their Contemporary American Art Collection. Here are two examples from a, the conclusion of this series. They were sent to the Scripps Exhibition in California last spring. Oops. <laughs> Many of you already know how this series ended. Only days before the show opened, the epicenter of an earthquake was only one mile from the gallery. The proper attitude was beautifully expressed in this quote from M.C. Richard's book, Centering in Pottery, Poetry, and the Person, and I quote, There are many marvelous stories of potters in ancient China. In one of them, a noble is riding through a town, and he passes a potter at work. He admires the pot the man is making, their grace and a kind of rude strength about them. He dismounts from his horse and speaks with the potter. How are you able to form these vessels so that they possess such convincing beauty? Oh, answers the potter, you are looking at the mere outward shape. What I am forming lies within. I am interested only in what remains after the pot has been broken. This experience could make one believe in miracles, as one jar survived the fall. I wrote this statement for the exhibition opening. Some experiences are beyond human control. Earthquakes are among them. How we respond measures our resourcefulness, which is always best with a little sense of humor. Therefore, the decision to display the damaged work is a continuation of the creative process. The intrinsic value of these pieces remains the same, 
and honest expression of the human spirit. Following the Cactus Jar series, I once again experienced burnout in that direction. I had resolved my proposed questions. I needed, needed to move on to the next unknown. These were done after I had such problems with those cactus wall plates, um, the last ones that I showed you at the beginning of my sabbatical. I spent three months working on those cactus wall plates before giving up the ghost sale to say, you know, in a sense, and um, started exploring this uh, bird series. They began as flat wall slabs and developed into these wall, <coughs> excuse me, wall reliefs. I was struggling very much to find my way again. The important part was that one, they were hand built rather than being wheel thrown, and they were wall pieces. And in the end, they ended up being the stepping stones to my present work. The Quran states, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will get you there. Wayne Higby, a nationally known contemporary American ceramicist, gave this advice to a graduate student. Even if you don't know what you're doing, keep working. It will come to you. The same sentiment was expressed by Paul Soldner when he asked a graduate student if she knew what she was doing. She very hesitantly said, no. His reply was, very good. <laughs> because I knew the cactus form so well, I returned to that motif after the bird series. But instead of painting them on the forms, I decided why not just build them three-dimensionally. At first, they were semi-realistic, but that wasn't a solution. As they became more, ex more abstract, they were more fun to play with. But these were small scale. I was still struggling to find my muse again. I was given great advice by a friend of mine when he suggested, just make them as large as a refrigerator. <laughs> Easier said than done with clay, but the idea hit a very responsive chord. So this piece is seven and a half feet long. The method of construction is drape mold over a bag filled with vermiculite. The process itself is very direct, very spontaneous, and gives the results that I wanted. These are two more slides that help to explain the actual process. The first ones were more directly related, uh, related to specific, specific plants, but they were loose and free and fun to make, and I was having a good time, and they were large. These slides represent a breakthrough for me in two major ways. The form of the yellow one on the left is quite stiff, and the surface is glazed. The one on the right has much more movement and the use of the glaze has been replaced with a low fire salting process, which produces a drier and less controlled appearance, which was helpful for these pieces. I'm now relying on the firing process to complete my pieces and to give all the surprises that come out. Anything at this point is acceptable on the surface, which is just a great way to work. This form is based now on accumulated knowledge about cactus, but not on any specific plant. It also represents the happy accident. Originally, it was two different pieces, two separate pieces. But when I was firing them, two major portions of the two separate pieces self-destructed in the kiln. But by combining all of the sections that remained, it resulted in a more interesting form than originally had been conceived.
two more examples of this. This piece is currently on display in Tempe, Arizona, and will travel to museums throughout the country for the next two years. The philosopher Heidegger stated, we must meet the unknown future by bringing to bear everything that has been, been shaped by us in the past. That's exactly what occurred to me last summer. I was invited to be in a national teapot exhibition. My immediate reaction was to say no. I was heavily involved with the cactus wall forms. I was not interested in dropping what I was doing to go back to the potter's wheel and make teapots. But then the light in my brain turned on. I called the organizers and asked them a few questions and then decided to participate in the show. These are large um, wall, teapot wall pieces. I've simply transformed the cactus form into a teapot form. They are about the essence of teapots, and they very much come out of the cactus direction, and also low fire salting was used in the one on the left. The one on the right, I ran into very many problems with the surface of it. I was using terra sigillata, and it kept peeling on me. After four different firings, I gave up on the whole thing and bought, and bought chrome spray paint. <laughs> and it worked just fine. <laughs> you can't use it anyway. <laughs> also, it went along with the idea of you know, silver tea service and all that kind of thing. I thought it fit in. <laughs> this one is called spiked tea. <laughs> <laughs> you can come over and test some. <laughs> I am using the same classical forms as my former teapots, but these are funkier. Well, the other ones weren't funky at all, they were very serious. These are supposed to be very funky. They're supposed to be humorous. But the surprise to me was how much patience it took to put on these little spikes. And then how much patience it took to paint the ends of each one of those with powdered bronze and glue <coughs> mixture, since each one had been painted twice. I was doing this last fall upstairs in the ceramic studios, and my students thought I was totally crazy. I think they liked the result, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> they can tell me later. The thing about my work, um, it always seems to require this ingredients of patience, no matter how hard I might try to get away from it. This one is Spike T1. It's the one I actually sent to the um, Teapot Invitational. It's always interesting how one thing does lead to another. The clay patties on the surface of these pieces, which are now painted that sort of gold bronze, are actually part of the low fire salt process, for they make color changes and are supposed to be removed after the firing but I really responded positively to that, how they added another dimension to the spikes, so I incorporated them into the finished piece. Michael Cardew, a master English potter, has a marvelous quote which relates to this work. He was a functional potter, but he stated, a teapot has little to do with the efficient pouring of tea. It is first and foremost a poem written in form. <laughs> Here is the most impressive cactus I've ever seen. <laughs> it presents a great challenge to me in terms of scale and memorabilia. <laughs> My goal was when I saw this in Aspen last summer was to take a ride in that hot air balloon but it wasn't going off the ground at that time, unfortunately. I would like to share with you one of my very favorite quotes. It is by the English potter, Michael Cardew. It is a sentiment that I carry very close to my heart, and it forms the base from which I teach. Amateur, professional, how I hate those rigid categories. 
Amateur just means you love it. Professional merely means that you are good enough to make a living that way. But good professionals, if they stay alive, will never lose the spark and the freshness, even some of the clumsiness coming from their probably amateur beginnings. And the amateurs are always being drawn on irresistibly by glimpses of things that at the beginning they never thought were in their range. I have a final message for my students. If you forget everything I've ever tried to teach you, please remember the thought contained in this final quote by Wordsworth. Give all thou canst. High heaven rejects the lower of nicely calculated less or more. Many of you are aware that I'm on a leave of absence from Westminster College this spring, and I'm an artist in residence at Scripps College in Claremont, California. And now, I'm now going to share with you some of the slides from that experience of this spring. Oops. That script's on the left. It's very beautiful and very idealistic. In the morning, one could go to the beach. And in the afternoon, one could go skiing in these snow-capped mountains in the back. Mm -hmm. However, I've not done any of those things. Like all the other students um, working at Scripps, I live in the ceramic studio seven days a week from morning until very, very late at night. On the right is the art department courtyard. Because the weather's so nice all the time, of course, it's a great place for everyone to gather and um, talk and have a drink or two. The entire experience revolves around fire and around clay. The clay mixer on the left goes 24 hours a day to supply tons and tons of clay for all the various students that are there. On the right is a photograph of the studio in which I work. Um, there are 15 of us that work down there at tables, plus all of the undergraduate students at Scripps. Our space is very crowded, but because of the amount of energy, a tremendous amount of work gets done. On the left is Misaki. He's a 27-year-old Japanese student who is there also for the semester. Scripps attracts um, international people from all over the world to come and study there. On the right is Kent. He is working towards his MFA degree and just received it last week when he put up his exhibition. To give you an example of how hard everyone works, on Easter Sunday, there were 15 of us working in the studio, having a good time. Ceramics isn't the only thing that takes place there. There's also bronze pouring, there's plaster rooms, silk screening, jewelry making, all kinds of things revolve around the ceramic department. Besides working hard, we also take time to have a little fun. And a lot of it, actually. Monday night is seminar night. Every, eve, every Monday night there's a program. This particular night, Masaki, who is also a professional sushi chef, gave up, uh, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> he gave a demonstration, taught us all how to do things, gave us all the proper names. I took him shopping to buy the fish and we went to eight different um, grocery stores, and these are oriental grocery stores, to find the proper fish. He's very, very picky about the fish that he selected for us. But as you can see, it was very beautiful, and at the end of the um, demonstration, we got to eat it all. These are called our orphan dinners. Because we live there all day long and all night long, at um, dinner time we just collect money from all the students, go out to the grocery store, buy whatever Masaki tells us we should buy, <laughs> and, and we let him cook, and we do the dishes. <laughs> we also chop and peel for him. We will do anything he tells us to do as long as he cooks the food. In fact, it's become so popular that um, all kinds of people from the whole area are coming now to our, our orphan dinners. 
I've also gained a lot of weight being here. <laughs> the entire atmosphere at Scripps is very much like the Amish community here. We all work together and we all help each other. The left slide is an example. One of the graduate students who was working toward her MFA and just put up her show last week was doing an installation piece as part of her um, exhibition. And she was needed 3,000 <coughs> ceramic cones, wheel-thrown ceramic cones. She had thrown 2,000 of them herself, but she was starting to run out of time. So she invited anyone who was willing to come to the ceramic studio early on a Saturday morning and work all day long and throw all day long. She would supply all of the clay. She um, cooked all the food, fed us, kept moving the wear boards, and we sat there and just produced as many of these cones as we could. They were immediately moved into the sun. Another group of students was moving in, them into the kiln. So it was entirely a group effort for this one section uh, of her exhibition. Needless to say, we all had a very good time. We all laughed a lot, and it created a tremendous community spirit. The slide on the right is an example of the same kind of thing. A previous graduate student um, was going to build a kill in her yard, but she wasn't really sure how to do it. She also needed a lot of people to move a four ton of clay um, about a mile and a half up the road from where it was stacked. So she came to Scripps and asked if um, some students would help her. So a whole thing was organized for her, and 25 of us showed up on Saturday morning, <coughs> moved all the bricks, built all the kill, built the kill in about six hours, and um, continued to have a good time. It was also a learning experience, but very much like the barn building experience that the Amish have. Then one long weekend, a number of us went to the desert to do a pit firing. Of course, it was beautiful. We had a good time. And in the end, we got gorgeous pots out of that big pit. At this present time, they're loading the pit on the right. One of the special experiences at Scripps is an annual party that is given every year in conjunction with the Scripps Ceramic Invitational that I was in the previous year when the earthquake hit. But the important thing about it that I discovered this year was the kind of work and kind of community it took to put on this um, gigantic party where a thousand people came to the opening. First of all, the entire studios, upstairs and downstairs, get washed down, all the wheels get washed, all the windows get washed. We do t a total maintenance work on the entire um, ceramic facilities. Flowers are gathered from all over and huge bouquets of flowers are placed everywhere you can imagine. Um, corsages are made by students that are passed out to the people who are in the exhibit. We all sign up for different committees to work on. Um, it takes about four days to put this thing on. But we're also firing skills at the same time and continuing to, to do some of the work. But you do kind of plan around this extravaganza. On the left, um, we made 60 gallons of Brazilian bean soup. <laughs> now, it was quite hilarious to go to the grocery store shopping for this. It was even funnier when we started to soak the beans. We bought four gigantic garbage cans, clean ones, to start soaking the beans, and they just kept swelling and swelling and swelling. So we kept running back to the grocery store for more cans to put this stuff in. <laughs> we started at 6 a.m. chopping up all these vegetables that went in there. It took four hours to chop the onions alone. It was incredible. I've never seen anything like this. It was delicious in the end, but it was a lot of hard work, and of course, a lot of fun. We also made 800 sushi rolls. <laughs> Masaki was in charge. However, he couldn't roll that many himself, so we um, all learned how to make them. Some of ours turned out like cigars. Some of them fell apart. Those we ate on, uh, on the spot. But no one really cared what they looked like, but we really did have a good time making them. But it was hilarious to make these sushi rolls. But when we finished making all the stuff only five minutes before the um, large opening. At which time, three bands were hired to come and play, and dancing went on until 2 a.m. A thousand people were there. Needless to say, it was a lot of fun, but the people who had the most fun were those 25 to 30 of us who worked from 6 a.m. until, actually, until the whole thing was over. And of course, Sunday is cleanup. We all showed up at 10 a.m. to start cleaning up, which was quite massive. 
but it's all done with the, just a great spirit and a good feeling of um, camaraderie. The person responsible for this amazing clay community is Paul Soldner. And on the right, the cat caught me catnapping at 2 a.m. when I was firing one of the um, salt firing kills. And that's the end, folks. <laughs> Thank you.